I'm thankful for the heritage that God has given us. And uh, give honor to all the dads this morning that are here. You're, you are a vital part of our society. You're a vital part of our church. And the world is, has um, kind of tried to eliminate the masculinity of men. And um, I'm against that 100%. I'm man, all man, and will always be all man. I don't want to be anything but a man. I don't, I don't uh, apologize for that. And uh, just because uh, I am a man doesn't mean I have to be chauvinistic or conceited or uh, authoritarian or any of those things. No, I, I love my family, but I'm glad to be a man. And for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And I made that decision a long time ago. Amen. So I don't think you have to apologize for being a man. And I'm going to talk to you this morning. Uh, I want to be that man. And um, even though I couldn't remember the tune of it, <laughs> I still want to be that man. Amen. Uh, Jewish tradition insists that fatherhood is not necessarily biological. The one who raises a child is considered the true parent. And teachers are like fathers, who so much so that their, their honor takes um, precedence, especially in the situations where, where uh, the father is only a biological relationship. But it's the teacher who also provides, along with what a father provides, uh, guidance and values and discipline and direction and love. And so today, I'm thankful for uh, dads, but if you don't have a good experience uh, of the past with your dad, then it's, I think it's important this morning that you have someone in your life that will be a guidance and a direction to you as a man, a person that will share values and disciplines and direction and love, because it is a vital part of our society. Now, when you look at the first century, uh, families were, were presided over by fathers who could do whatever they pleased in their home. And so what has happened is uh, people get nervous of that type of mentality because it was abused in the past. Rome had a law called uh, Patria Postestis, which meant the father's power. Men who were Roman citizens were given absolute rights uh, over their families. And by law, the children and the wife were regarded as the patriarch's personal property. And he could do with them whatever he wanted. A displeased father could disown his children, sell them into slavery, or even kill them if he wished. And when a child was born, the baby was placed between the father's feet. And if the father picked up the baby, the child stayed in the home. And if the father walked away, turned away from the child, uh, the child was either left to die or sold at an auction. Seneca, which was a contemporary of the Apostle Paul, described Roman policy uh, around these terms with, with uh, some very unique phrases. When it came to children, compared them to animals. We slaughter a fierce ox. We strangle a mad dog. We, we plunge a knife into a sick cow. Children that are born weak or deformed are drowned. Things are actually not much better today in the sense of how the world has approached children. And we... We sometimes look at the past and say, can't even imagine the mentality of the culture of Roman citizens in the first century. But it's been like that since the beginning of time, that the value that God has put on life has, has become a disposable commodity in our society as it was in Rome. Over the last number of decades, 68 million children have been aborted. 
twice the population of our own country. And yet, we don't hear a lot about that, and you're even at times looked down if you mention anything about it. But I'm here to tell you tonight, or this morning, that that is an atrocity, and it's sure against everything the Bible stands for. See, the Bible calls Christian fathers to a different standard. Our kids are not property to own, but rather image bearers of a God. Image bearers of someone that they need to be trained to be like. Dads were called to provide a proper nurturing environment where our kids can grow up to love and to serve the Lord. It's counterculture than what the first century or even the 21st century is telling us by their actions. But it is still biblical today for dads to be dads in the home. And the New Testament challenges us to see the word father as a verb and not just as a noun. It's biologically easy to become a father, but biblically challenging to actually be a father. A father to children, because everything is against today. Unfortunately, everything is against you being a father in a proper sense to your children. I have my own beefs about things. I may share a couple with you. I don't have them in my notes, but they're in my head. They've been beefs for a long time. Maybe I'll just be transparent and share it with you. I decided when my wife and I got married that if we had children, they were going to be our children. <laughs> not her children and not my children. They were going to be our children. And one of the most frustrating things that ever happened to me as a parent was one day, my wife's a little more shy than I am, as you noticed. So when it comes to making phone calls and going into establishments and figuring out, you know, situations, she has no problem relinquishing the responsibility for me to do that for her. Some may say, well, you're taking the authority. No, it's not. She has no problem saying, you, you only have, I mean, if you only knew how many times I would say, no, you can do it. You can do it. You can make the phone call. You're able. You're, you're, I mean, no, you do it. <laughs> They'll listen to you. They'll, I've heard all that stuff. So one day, this is a way back when our children were young, and I had a question about the family allowance. I was questioning something. And so I thought, well, I'll only do the smart thing. Make a call. Find out what's going on. What the issue is. An explanation. There has to be an easy explanation for what the situation is. And so I, as the parent of my children, the co-equal parent of our children, thought, I'll make the call. And on the other line came this wonderful person. And I started to ask my question. And the response was, oh, we're sorry, sir. We cannot talk to you about that. We can only talk to the mother. And I have to tell you, down deep inside, my blood started to boil. It was not a lack of respect for the mother at all. It was something inside that said that I was not part of the parent. Now, you can disagree with me, and you can work for that situation, and you can tell people that. It irked me to the bone. And as you can tell, my kids are growing, and I have seven grandkids, and it still has not been let go. 
I have not been able to get over what society promotes. See, it's a silly illustration. My wife was able to get on the phone, get the answer. It was not a big issue. Life went on, and we have survived, and our kids have grown. But it was the point, the point of what society continues to push. And I understand there are situations where there's deadbeat dads and there's people that don't pull their weight and they don't act like proper parents and all of that stuff. I understand all of that, but not everybody is not a good father. See, we have a primary part of responsibility of striking a balance between love and discipline, parenting, keeping care of our children, grandchildren. The Bible gives us scripture. And it speaks about the father in the sense of a verb and not just a noun. Hebrews chapter 12, and verse 7. Let God train you, for he is doing what any loving father does for his children. Whoever heard of a son who has never or was never corrected? Paul writes to Thessalonica and he says, As you know how we exhorted and, and confronted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Paul writes in Ephesians, fathers, don't exasperate your children by coming down hard on them. Take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the master. Church of Colossia, fathers, don't, uh, don't scold your children so much that you become a discouragement and they quit trying. The Bible gives us an admonishment that I want to be that man. I want to be that man. And in writing to the Corinthians, Paul compares his role as an apostle to the role that's filled by a dad. No one, no one can take the unique place of a dad. I'm thankful for organizations like Big Brothers, and I'm thankful for all that kind of stuff. But nobody replaces the dad. Oh, I'm only getting a little handful of amens, but it doesn't matter to me. It says this. Paul writes to the Corinthians, it says, And though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. He writes that you can, this is a, a, the message way of saying, there are a lot of people around who can't wait to tell you what you've done wrong. But there aren't many fathers willing to take the time and the effort to help you grow up. See, one of the biggest threats to the generation that we are now raising is the breakdown of the family. It's the first institution that was ever put in place, and the enemy cannot stand the family. And he does everything in his power to destroy homes and marriages and husbands and wives and disunity between parents and children. Can I tell you this morning, you're not fighting and wrestling against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Strongholds that the enemy would love to destroy because he knows that strong people develop strong families and strong families develop a strong church. And a strong church is a threat to society in his domain. But in the wonderful constructor of what God has is what develops into a strong family of God. Lifelong marriage has provided the foundation for social order. Everything of value rests on those underpinnings. Historically, when the family begins to unravel in any culture, everything else is adversely affected. 
And we in Canada are not immune to that very thing. 70% of black babies and 20% of white babies that are born in North America are born out of wedlock. Most of them will never know their father or have a father figure or love in their life. Only one-third of children born in North America will live with both biological parents through to the age of 18. Only 33% of kids will have both parents in their life to the age of 18. How does that affect us? Oh, I feel, I feel like preaching this morning. Huh. Because I'll tell you what, uh, we, we, can, we can preach all kinds of things, but if we don't have strong homes, can you preach with me a little bit? If we don't have strong homes, uh, there isn't going to be a strong church. This church is made up of people, and people make up strong homes. And, and, and the culture that's being pushed today, let me, let me tell you some statistics. 85% of children with, with behavior disorders are from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts are from fatherless homes. 70% of teen pregnancies are from fatherless homes. 80% of rapists are from fatherless homes. 75% of teen patients in drug abuse are from fatherless homes. I'm not making it up. These are the statistics that are out there. 70% of juveniles in correctional institutions are from fatherless homes. 85% of youth in prison are from fatherless homes. 83% or excuse me, 63% of suicides in young people are from fatherless homes. I think the statistics tell us that a dad is important in every house. See, 40, 45 years ago, we believed that poverty and racial discrimination were primarily responsible for juvenile, juvenile crime and behavioral problems. But nearly all the evidence points to a family breakup as the real culprit of what's happening in our society. And let me tell you, it predicts a societal catastrophe if we don't turn around how serious it is about having dads be dads in the house. 72% of North Americans say that physical absence of fathers is the most serious problem facing any family today. And so I asked you this morning, how can we buck that trend? How can we commit totally to make sure our home is everything God wants it to be? Because I want to be that man. Oh, I've got lots of failures. And I've got lots of things to correct. And I've had to apologize I don't know how many times. But it doesn't change the fact that I love my family and I want my family to be saved. And I want my home to be strong. And I want my children to know God. And I want my grandkids to grow up, to, hallelujah, and have a relationship with God. I want to be that man. Yeah. We get bent out of shape because of a few idiots. It's true. There are some idiots. But can I tell you, Christian fathers don't lie. Hear me. Christian fathers don't steal. Christian fathers don't covet. Christian fathers don't serve money. Christian fathers don't just make a child and then abandon it. Christian fathers don't cheat on their wives. Christian fathers don't send their kids to church and not take them. Christian fathers have a real relationship with God. The greatest need of the hour of our day in our country is for dads to be dads, to be the man that God has wanted you to be. Many, many of us 
were raised in homes where maybe that was not the case. But the Bible has a special value that it shows as the ideal of what a father is to be. And God himself gives us that story of what a father is to be like. Don't put your eyes and values on what another family's mistakes were. Take your eyes and say, what does God want a dad to be? What does God want me as the father of my home to be? And I'm reading this in a translation from Luke 15 that tells it as a story. Then he said, there was once a man who had two sons. The younger said to his father, Father, I want right now what's coming to me. So the father divided the property between them. It wasn't long before the younger son packed his bags and left for a distant country. There, undisciplined and dissipated, he wasted everything he had. After he had gone through all his money, there was a bad famine all throughout the country, and he began to hurt. He signed on with a citizen there who assigned him to his fields to slop the pigs. He was so hungry, he would have eaten the corn cobs in the pig slop, but no one would give him any. That brought him to his senses. He said, all those farmhands working for my father sit down to three meals a day, and here I am starving to death. I'm going back to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. He got right up and went home to his father. And when he was still a long way off, his father saw him, his heart pounding. He ran out, embraced him, and kissed him. The son started his speech, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. But the father wasn't listening. He called to the servants, quick, bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then get a grain-fed heifer and roast it. We're going to feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here, given up for dead and now alive, given up for lost and now found. And they began to have a wonderful time. All this time, his older son was out in the field, and when the day's work was done, he came in, and as he approached the house, he heard the music and dancing. Calling over one of the house boys, he asked what was going on. He told him, your brother came home. Your father has ordered a feast, barbecued beef. I just stopped there on purpose. Seems like a good place to take a break. Because he has, he has him home safe and sound. The older brother stalked off in an angry sulk and refused to join in. His father came out and tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't listen. The son said, look, how many years I've stayed here serving you, never giving you one moment of grief, but have you ever thrown a party for me and my friends? Then this son of yours who has thrown away your money on whores, shows, whores and shows and and you go all out with a feast. His father said, son, you don't understand. You're with me all the time. And everything that is mine is yours. But this is a wonderful time. And we have to celebrate. This brother of yours was dead. And he's alive. He was lost. And he is found. That's the story of Luke chapter 15. See, the results of living away from our Heavenly Father always influence, and they always end up disastrous. And nothing can prevent the ultimate consequences for it catching up with us, and that's what happened here. The boy went away, and the farther we run, the more destruction happens in our lives, and 
And it, it, it appears at first that the world's exciting. The Father's house is the only place where real life and, and experience happen. But it appears for a moment of time that the world is exciting. And the Bible tells us that there are pleasures in sin for a season. But the world, church, is an illusion. The Father's house is reality. And some people are surprised that God acts like the Father in this story. He doesn't do anything to stop the Son from taking advantage of Him. He doesn't even try to keep Him from running away from home and engaging in the behaviors that He knows will destroy the young man's life. He asked for the estate to be to be settled before the father's death, and that was an absolute insult in the culture that he lived in. But the father still gives it to him. Isn't it disturbing? You may think that the father refuses to step in and to change his son's mind. Change the direction. Change the outcome. He refuses to do so. It's similar today. Isn't it disturbing that God refuses to step in and stop people from doing what is wrong? He has a non-interference policy. (laughs) Why doesn't God do something about the evil in the world? And why doesn't he stop people from hurting other people and doing evil things because God has given us, church, the awesome gift of free will, and he will not interfere. It would no longer be free will if he did. And we think that God should be more controlling, but we only think that about other people. And when it comes to us, we know... (laughs) That's not actually how we think. We wouldn't want him to force the right things on us or stop us from doing the wrong things. But when we want to rebel, we don't want anyone else trying to control us. And God knows that that is the moment that he cannot force his will upon any of our lives. But rather he wants us to fall into obedience with him because that's what we want to do. Yeah, so you have to understand in the culture of Jesus' day, children did not leave home when they became adults. They actually just built another room on the house. Man, I'm glad culture's changed. No, I'm just teasing. That's what they did. Kids didn't move away. People who had the finance made their house bigger. So the family could remain with them. That was the culture. It was never the father's desire for his son to ever leave. Never. And I want you to notice that the father does not go to the distant country in search of his son. He didn't rescue him against his will. He will let him go until he has discovered for himself that the world is a lie. How ironic that the son's pursuit of pleasure brought him much pain. The constant companion of pain. He can easily see the foolishness of this boy the dad knows oh he's making a huge mistake but i'm just going to let him go and i'm going to stay here and wait for him see the lifestyle of dad didn't change he was going to be that man can i tell you this morning 
you'll never help your kids by condoning or going along with or letting them know that the world's okay. As a dad, I was never trying to be friends with my kids. I wasn't their friend. I was their parent. I'm still their parent. Oh, I try to be friendly with them once in a while. But it doesn't matter that they're 30. It doesn't matter if the youngest one's going to be 26. It doesn't matter. 27. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change my mind. I'm still the parent. I'm still going to be home. I'm still going to be where God's placed me to be. And this dad said, you can run and you'll find out that it's a lie. But when you come to your senses, I'm going to be right where you need me to be. And when you come home, I'm going to welcome you home. That's the man I want to be. Listen, man. Don't be part. Well, you know. I just don't want to be too hard. I just don't want to, I, I just don't want to upset. I, I just don't want to drive away. Stand firm where God puts you because they need a place to return. All four of you that clapped your hands, thank you. But it's the truth. You got to be where God's placed you to be because when someone needs to come home, they need you there. It's not fun having a wayward child. It's not at all peaceful. It's not at all easy to sleep. It's not at all that it's comfortable. But can I tell you as pastor this morning, you've got to remain where you need to be, dads, because they need a place to come home. And they need to know that when they come to the Father's house, that that's where it's always been. That's how it's always been. That's how it will always be. Hallelujah. That you are standing for what God has placed in you to be that man. Men, get a backbone. Don't go running into a distant country. That won't help. The world looks so appealing and people seem to be so free. And you hear that phrase, I'm now free. No, you're not. No, you're not. You have a new master. You have a new master. God hasn't changed. He hasn't changed. He's always at the Father's house. He's never left. You think, and people think that they're invincible and that they're immune to the destruction that takes place in the world. And it will happen to other people, but it won't happen to you. And that you're smarter than them. And you'll be able to deal with it. And you'll be able to get by. And you'll be able to navigate. And no, 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 no. Don't be the man that God's asked you to be and stay right there. This is what Paul writes to Church of Galatia. Don't be misled. Remember, you can't ignore God and get away with it. A man will always reap just the kind of crop he sows. If he sows to please his own Wrong desires, he will be planting seeds to evil, and he will surely reap a harvest of spiritual decay and death. But if he plants the good things of the Spirit, he will reap the everlasting life that the Holy Spirit gives him. See, a wise person accepts God's truth and lives their life accordingly. A foolish person insists on testing God's truth by experience before they will believe it. And that's what happened with this son. That's what happened with the son. The rebellious son was living, he was living off his father's resources the whole time he was away. He would have had to work a lifetime to get what he had been given from the estate 
before he left. He was squandering the inheritance and throwing away that what uh, it, that was what was intended to provide for the rest of his life. He was throwing away his future. Prostitutes and parties, they were all paid out of the father's money. He used the blessings and the resources of his father against his father. I asked you this morning, dads, what are you doing with the resources and the blessings that God has given you? Because in this story, everything that was his dad's was being used against his dad. It's very important to notice that. And the worst part of this young man's life is not that he went away to a far country and wasted his inheritance, but he never developed a relationship with his father before he left that he would never leave. The culture was, we're just going to build on a room for your family. But he had no relationship with his dad, and off he went. And we look at that story, and we say, oh, what a terrible mistake. But there's a third figure in the story. And he got upset when his brother came home. And what's sad about this whole situation is he didn't have a relationship with his father either. Because he would have known what the desire of his father was. That, oh, my boy has come home. He was lost, but now he's found. He was dead, but he's now alive. Do you know what that tells me? It tells me that there are people that can leave the church because they don't have a relationship with their heavenly father. It also tells me that you can be in the church and not still have a relationship with your heavenly father. Both are a tragedy. I want, you to, I want you to see what dad did. He ignored the son's request to be a servant. Oh, don't be silly. Don't be silly. You're not, you're not becoming a hired hand here. Bring, bring out the robe. Bring out the ring. Let's have a barbecue. We're going to have a barbecue. There's nothing about dad. He's already been watching. He's already waiting. And the Bible says when he saw him afar off. Oh, this wasn't, uh, well, you know, I think uh, once a day I'll look out the window and see if he's coming. No, no. He was continually looking. He was the man. Hallelujah. Everything that he wants us to be is what he was portraying himself as the father. And Jesus tells the story. And in 2022, if there is ever an hour that we need to take the attributes, the principles of a story as dads, it's this story. You're not going to give up on kids that leave. And you're not going to give up on kids that stay. You're going to be the same no matter what the culture says, no matter what society says, no matter how much it tries to diminish you as a man. You're going to be the man that God wants you to be, the dad that God wants you to be. I know. I, I know the challenge and the possibility of being taken wrong. Even this morning. I would hope after 10 years, you would know that I was not a chauvinistic pig. I would hope. But I'm not going to leave, leave my wife to lead our house. I'm not going to let her lead our house spiritually. I'm going to be the man that God's asked me to be. 
well, you know, I'm, if I do that, I'm, I, I'm scared she's going to leave. It's inevitable. She will leave anyway then. No, hear what I'm saying to you, church. Stand on your feet. Take the authority that God has given you as a man of God and be a man of God in 2022 and say, as for me and my house, I'm going to love them. I'm going to be willing to die for them, but I'm going to lead this family in the way God wants me to be. I can't say it to you enough that what was instilled in me from my dad Say, Pastor, not every home is the same. And to that I agree. But the parable that I've read to you is a parable about a dad, not about a son. Well, it's called the prodigal son, Pastor. Doesn't matter what people call it. The parable is about a dad. Because if dad wasn't what dad was supposed to be, the son wouldn't have had anything to come home to. And I'm thankful that he came to his census and came home. But I'm even more thankful that when he came home, his dad was the man that he was supposed to be. And because he was, his son was invited in. The other son was given explanation. Oh, son, you've already got everything. This is already all yours. But the one that was gone, he's come home. This is an exciting day. That all was possible because dad was the man. He was supposed to be. I have three children, and they're a long ways from perfect, as any child is. But I love them dearly as their father. And they all know that I would do anything possible, anything possible for them. I drive crazy amounts of hours to babysit kids. I mean, it's insane. Some of the trips I take, people go get their car checked out before they go on that length of journey. I wake up and it becomes just an afterthought. Let's do that. That's, those are my kids. Those are my grandkids because I love them. And I would do anything for them. But my love for them is nothing comparable to your heavenly father that's waiting at home for someone to return. He's, he's, he's been the same yesterday, today, and he will be forever. He's looking afar off. Waiting for someone to return. It's not going to be judgment and condemnation and you, you need a good spanking. No, it's not that at all. It's the opposite. He runs with open arms and a loving heart and says, bring, bring the, bring uh, the robe and bring the ring and get out the heifer. Someone has come home. Someone has returned home. That's the dad of the story. Yeah. And that's the example. Music come. That's the example to every father in this room this morning. That's watching online or listening. Say, Pastor, the more I pray for my kids, the worse it gets. Just keep praying. 
Just keep staying at home. Just keep being faithful. Just be a place of refuge. Continue to be a lifeline. Be there when needed. But don't change what you stand for. Because they need a place to come home. That when they come home, it'll be a place of safety. It'll be a place of restoration. It'll be a place of what it was like before they left. Listen, there'll be mistakes and there'll be all kinds of failures that will happen in life. But you've got to stand firm, man. You've got to stand in your place as a dad. Oh. Mm. I watch this. I visualize homes. Homes where the men are relinquishing their responsibility as a spiritual leader and a spiritual authority of their house. And in the homes that I watch that happen, moms are doing their best. Moms are trying to hold it together. Moms are doing everything in their own power. And I'm thankful for you, moms. But I'm telling you, men, get a hold of yourself this morning. Shake yourself in the presence of God and be the man that he wants you to be. And you'll see something happen in your home. Oh, there will be a battle at first. There will be a, a fight over authority because the enemy don't like it. And there will be challenges that will come. And if there wasn't a challenge, then it's probably nothing worth fighting for. But don't be afraid of a challenge. God has given you an authority as a man in your house. And if you're a father and you don't want to love God and lead God and make sure your family's saved, then I feel sorry for you. Because it doesn't have to be that way. It can be the opposite. Where you stand in the gap on behalf of. And you stand in prayer between the porch and the altar and you cry spare the people Lord spare my kids spare my family spare my spouse and you stand in that gap on behalf and let me tell you the authority that God has given you as a man of God cannot be matched it cannot be matched and I know with being a man comes the responsibility and there is a great responsibility with that but do not relinquish the challenge in 2022 because the statistics are real I'm caught I'm caught this morning I know I'm supposed to be coming to a close I want to know if there's men that will stand this morning. Step out of your seats. Get past pride. Get past selfishness. Get past what other people think. I wonder if there's men in this church that will stand to your feet this morning and make your way to this altar. Say, Pastor, I'm going to, I'm going to take a hold of what you're preaching this morning. I'm going to be that man that, that God wants me to be. I'm going to be the dad like it was in the, in the story. I'm going to be that person that God wants me to be. I'm going to go against the, the culture and the society of this world. I'm going to be counterculture to that. And I'm going to stand to my feet. And I'm going to look this world straight into the eye and say, you know what? I'm going to take a stand and live for God. I'm going to lead my family. I'm going to be a prayer warrior. I'm going to be the person that God wants me to be. I'm going to fight against the statistics of what the world says I'm going to go against that and I'm going to stand I'm going to stand in the gap for my family I'm going to be a watchman on the wall 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch and pray for my family. I'm going to lead spiritually. I'm going to lead in devotion. I'm going to lead in prayer. I'm going to lead in church. I'm going to lead in faithfulness. I'm going to lead in sacrifice. I'm going to lead in everything that God wants me to be. Because on this day, in 2022, we need men that will be the man that God wants you to be. Oh, God, stir our church, stir our homes, stir our families, stir our men this morning. I'm thankful for every other person that is here today, God. God, you placed into my spirit this morning. God, you placed into my spirit a message for the men of this church, the dads, the fathers, the figures of this congregation, God, that's leading, leading by example, leading by action leading God with what you want them to be. That's it, man. Hallelujah. Reach out to God right now. Don't be afraid to do it. Hallelujah. Don't be afraid to reach out to Him. Hallelujah. On on your own behalf right now. Not about anyone else. It's only about you and God right now. God, you know the challenges that men face today, God. God, you know the Lord, the things that are against the family and the things that are against the homes and the things that are against men as individuals, God. I pray against every one of those things this morning. I pray, God, for a power and an anointing that comes upon every man. Hallelujah, that they would rise to the challenge and be the man that you want them to be. Uh That's it, church. Hallelujah. I know we're accustomed to singing and all that, but that's okay. Just take a few moments right here. Just take a few moments and let God speak to you. Let God talk to your heart. Let God lead you. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. God, let there be courage that rises in our men. A determination like never before. A fortitude, God that arises in the mindset of every man. Hallelujah. Got a a determination, God, to stand for the things of you. God, to be loving to their, their spouses and their families, to be loving, Lord, to their children, to be sacrificial, God, to the people around them. God, to be everything that you were in that story. God, open arms waiting for children to come home. Open arms, God, for children, God, that are cold in their relationship with you. Open arms, God, to be, God, to every every child, every spouse, every grandchild. Help us, God, to have the courage, God, to be everything you want us to be. Uh-huh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 